lot of people have been asking, can we learn some Hebrew? And in uh, response to that, oh, Scott. <laughs> uh, you should have uh, passed out uh, a piece of paper, a couple of papers with, with one of the psalms on it. So we're going to uh, sing through this. We didn't know that you could sing Hebrew, but you easily can. So I'll play the piano. Maybe we should do the words first. <laughs> <laughs> words go like this. Repeat that for me. He name I told. 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 That's all the words there are. That's Psalm 133. Here we go again. He may my toe. 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 Contest. It wasn't just for bass. It was anything bad. Is that correct? On Lake Pepin, he called. There were 300 participants. Who do you think was number one? Yeah. It was Ben. Yeah. They took his fish in and they noticed that it had a scar right in between the eyes. What do you think Ben had used to catch that fish? <laughs> no, that part's a lie. Ben, <laughs> Ben did win, and he got a nice prize for his college education. I don't know, I think he's going to Luther College, but I'm yeah. not sure. No, I made that part up. <laughs> All right, let's begin with prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you for the good times that we have when brothers and sisters dwell together. We thank you for these times of study, Help us to grow, help us to learn, help us to love one another, help us especially now to know how in our country to bring about shalom, peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I put an outline on the board here. Uh, oh, I was going to tell you, this song I have taught whenever I do camp, I used to do camps and things like that. And uh, students all learned Hine Matobu Vanaim Shevetakim Gam Yachad. That's Psalm 133, which is what? 
what is it in English? You see it there? Behold how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. See it? Yeah. Now, after about 10 years, when we were at Outlaw Ranch in South Dakota, I got a card in the mail. Somebody wrote and said, I want to tell you of an event that happened. I was now a counselor at Camp Koinonia in New York. Anybody know Camp Koinonia? Some of you have been there, yeah. And uh, she said, we were going through the woods hiking, and we were singing camp songs. And we sang, He Name I Told, You Old Hog and Pleasant. All of a sudden, a group came running out of a place further down the tra trail, and they joined in with us. And they were Jewish kids from New York City. <laughs> so, she said here we had Lutherans from all over the place, Jewish kids. We sang, He Name I Told. And I think God smiled, she said. So, what can a song do? I taught at, I was teaching at Berkeley, California. Among the things we learned was He Name I Told. And I said that um, we could do the Hora to this song, but I said I'm no good at doing that, and I've tried to teach it, and I won't even try. One fellow put up his hand, a big gangly basketball player, and he said, I'll do it. What? Him? I didn't, uh, his name was Dean Wienhoff from Edgerton. Anybody know where Edgerton is? Yeah, that's right. So he got everybody lined up and taught them how to do the Hora. So that he could do. And the coaches were always asking me about him. How are his grades coming? And so on in religion. Because we had to keep uh, the basketball team. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> he name I told. All right. The other thing that I wanted to say about that was that, uh, uh, well, that's it. That's he name I told. Vumanaim shevet akim gamiakat. It's simply uh, one of the psalms, namely Psalm 133. You can see it in both Hebrew and English on the handout that I've given you. Happiness, we talked a little bit about that last time. Since that time, I've read this book, the Mayo Clinic <coughs> excuse me, Handbook for Happiness, and I recommend it to you. This uh, Who Knows Amit So, you certainly know him, you people that work at uh, Mail or whatever. And this, uh, this has got some interesting stuff in. I just about finished with it. The other thing was, was in the paper about this course at Yale, and I just printed this off. Yale University's new course on happiness is the most popular course in its 316-year history. Here's what it's all about. Happiness. On, it says on day one, 1,300 students signed up at Yale. Within a week, the enrollment had grown to a record-breaking 1,200 students about 25% of the entire undergraduate student body. Happiness, of course, they're doing it. It's becoming popular. So we're right on the cutting edge, you see. Uh, all right. Psalm 1, if you have a Bible around, uh, there were some on the chairs or whatever, but I wanted to take a look at Psalm 1. And then we're going to look at Psalm 32. <clears throat> the latest fad in the studies of Psalms is to see the Psalm, the book of Psalms, not as a uh, hymn book, although we've often said that the Psalms are the hymn book of the Old Testament, but to see that the Psalms are also a prayer book. In other words, the Psalms, as you take them and look at the order they're in and study them and read them, they can be used as a prayer book. And in fact, they've been used that way. And as you study the Psalms, you could discover that there are five books of the Psalms. They're called just like there are five what in the Bible? What has got five parts in it? Not a very good question. 
Yeah, the Pentateuch. Thank you very much. Exactly, the Pentateuch. Five books. What are they? Genesis, Exodus, Excellent. Good. Okay. Well, if you look now at Psalm number one, uh, if you've got a Bible, otherwise I'll just read this. It says there, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. Well, then it continues and it says, These people who are happy are like trees planted by streams of water. In all they do, they prosper. You've met these kind of people. Everything they touch seems to go. It seems to prosper. Well, uh, why this tree metaphor? That's the first picture of believers in the Bible. Here we're going to do this, and some of you are afraid of doing these small group things, I know. So I'll be very brief. But try it. I would like you to do two, two things. Close your eyes as you're sitting there and visualize a tree think of your favorite tree i've got one not by my uh, grandparents farm in iowa i'm thinking of it thinking of it think of a tree why is that a good picture for a believer why would you want to be like a tree give me some responses what about a tree as you look at it deep roots deep roots good what else shelter Fruit, oh yes, fruitful. Shade. Shade, excellent. Climbing. Reaching toward heaven. <clears throat> Poems were made by fools like me. <coughs> Finish it. But only God can make a tree. Written by? Good, okay. Uh, all right, there's that tree picture you've got. Now, why would, why is that a good uh, picture, metaphor, for a believer. All these things. So I want to be well-rooted. I want to be productive. I want to be like a beautiful tree. Now, how do I get to be this way? What do you have to do? What does it say? How do you get to be like... By streams of water. By streams of water? Meditate. You meditate. Now, why the word meditate? The word meditate in Hebrew is Hagah, as you know, as you know, Hagah. <laughs> Somebody take a look. Look at Isaiah 31, 4. If you've got a Bible, find Isaiah chapter 31, 4. Isaiah is going to be in the Old Testament. And I'd like somebody to read Isaiah 31, Four, let me find it here. Unless the Lord says to me, a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against it, be not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down and fight upon Mount Zion and upon the hill. Where is the Hebrew verb haga in what, uh, what Ruth just read? Where is it? It's translated differently, you know. But it started out, it said, For thus the Lord said to me, as a young lion or a young, as a lion or young lion growls over its prey, and so on and so forth. Where is the word that's translated meditate in Psalm 1, but in Isaiah it's translated what? Growl. Growl. Now, what in the world is that? Why, what, why is Hagah, which is translated as uh, meditate in Psalm 1, why, how does it get to be growl? Now, let's go back to Psalm 1. And I would like us to read that together. All right? Psalm 1. Start reading everybody together. Wrong. <laughs> now, why? What did you do? You read this, and how did you read it? 
in English. <laughs> you read it in unison, right? Do it again. Listen to yourselves. Now start out. Uh, most of you have NRSV. Just start reading. And so those who do not follow the advice of the wicked all right, let's say you go to the synagogue, you go to the Temple of Aaron in St. Paul, that's the synagogue I know best, and you are, uh, no, then you have to go to the Orthodox synagogue, actually, in St. Paul or any place. How do you read this as an Orthodox Jew? What do you do? Now you're going to have to all stand up. First you always stand when you're reading. Please stand just for a moment. Let's stand. And I would like you to read this out loud. You do it like this. Look at the way I do. This is the way you you do, you know, you bend at the waist and get sort of get into it. As I tell my students, it's the old Duke Ellington, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got Yeah, you gotta swing these things. So you're in the synagogue, you're reading, but you don't read in unison. You just read at your own speed. Now just read it. Let's hear it. Start reading. Read fast. Read slow. Read. Sing it if you want. Here you go. Psalm 1. All right. Enough. Enough of that. Paul's getting disgusted. Enough of that. But what, what, what do you hear now? And why would it say the growling of a lion is the word Hagan? Because that's the way you read in the synagogue. You read it, you don't have to, why do you have to be so uptight and staged and, you know, march like Norwegians or something? You know, Germans, that's right. Okay, we can be seated. Now, that's the way it goes with Saul. Um, and if you're in the synagogue, you read it on your own, and you go to an Orthodox synagogue and just listen, and you hear people, oh, 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 you hear this kind of growling, and you think, why don't they know enough to read all together? They, they don't. They, they don't want to. They want to pray and address God individually, and they can just well do it. So, uh, all right, that's Psalm 1. Now, uh, just one other little anecdote before we go to the text. In 1970, uh, Martha and I took our children and we packed up all four children. We had, I think, 31 pieces of luggage or something. We went to Heidelberg, Germany for a year because I wanted to study with Klaus Westermann. Now, who was Klaus Westermann? Who here has heard of Klaus Westermann? Put your hand up. <clears throat> Paul was there. Our son. <clears throat> yeah, we took our kids. We went to Heidelberg. Now, uh, because Westermann, I think, is you know the most helpful teacher of Old Testament, and at that time, all of the Wissenschaftlich, scientific work in biblical studies was being done where Germany. You did doesn't mean anything unless you've studied in Germany for a year in Heidelberg or Tübingen or Münster or Munich or one of those towns. That's where the real study is going on. That still is true to a certain degree to this day. So anyway, uh, we went there and Westermann was very kind to us. I was Professor Limburg at that time, I was teaching at Augustana College, and so they treated me as a professor. You go through the line, and I wrote on my passport, Professor James Limburg, and the pass guy would see that, Herr Professor, come and see Forna. <laughs> yeah, you come, come ahead, you're a professor, after all, you shouldn't have to wait in line. Uh, that's the way it was. Well, Westermann told us he had been captured by the Russians was in Russian prison camp for a number of years, and he wanted to become a pastor. So what did he do? All he could take with him into prison was the New Testament and Psalms. Just a little, just like uh, uh, Pastor Hornfett has here. Just a little book like that. So he thought, I want to be an Old Testament professor, I better do Psalms because that's all I got. And he told us he traded his 
food rations for paper so he could write out his thoughts on the song. And he was in, as I said, uh, for a number of years. And as a result of this, he came out with a very simple thesis in studying the book of Psalms. And what is it? It is that the key to understanding the Psalms is to see that very simply they fall into two major categories, either Psalms of praise or Psalms of lament. Well, praise or lament. Sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. Swiftly follow the day. One season following another, laden with happiness, whoops, uh, <clears throat> or praise. What have I got? Laden, one season following another, happiness and tears. Laden with happiness and tears. Yeah, that's what it is. So, happiness and tears. And Vestermont said when you're studying the Psalms, the first thing you do is say, is this basically a psalm of praise or a psalm of lament? Is it happiness or is it tears? And uh, so that was it. And he's published, you know, probably a hundred books. And running through all of them are, is this thesis about the Psalms. Well, enough of that. Now, let's take a look at uh, the Psalm for the day, Psalm 32. So I printed that out for you. Take the, uh, if you can find it here, <clears throat> it says Introduction, the People's Book, and uh, this is right out of my little commentary I've written on the psalm. Let's read a bit of this. Who would like to read? Somebody from over here. I'll give you the mic. How about you, Barbara? How about reading a little? From this, can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Here. My grandfather. Uh, my grandfather ran a general store that carried everything necessary. Can you hear about there? No. Yeah. Put it close to your mouth. Put it real close to your mouth. Hello. There you go. Okay. That's what you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Parker. Why My grandfather ran a general store that carried everything necessary for life in a small Iowa town, from groceries and hardware to candy and clothing. On the floor in the middle of the store was a large key register surrounded by benches where farmers sat on Saturday evenings and told stories. Any of you had that experience? A large register right here. The farmers all came in and they sat around and they were telling about the hired man that did this or that or the bulldog that did that. A lot of good stories and we will continue, Barbara. We <coughs> children liked to gather around behind the benches and listen. We heard local gossip all night. Or brought to town by a traveling salesman. Uh, After, these guys, they, they <coughs> love to hang around my grandpa because he bought stuff from him. Go ahead. After a funeral in town, there might be serious reflections on life and death. The conversation offered advice on everything from repairing tractors to raising children. The sign out in front of the building read, The People's Store. Yeah, that was the name of his store. Continue, Barbara. The Bible's collection of 150 songs has a way of providing what is necessary for the lives of God's people. In this book, one discovers sad songs for times of sorrow and happy songs celebrating good times. The psalms offer reflection on the mysteries of death and life, on poverty and prosperity. And the book provides advice on everything from balancing work and rest to finding a marriage partner and raising children. The sign in front of this collection could be, could well be the people's book. <coughs> That's what the Psalms is. It's really uh, a collection of a variety of different Poems, uh, proverbs, sayings, whatever. Now I said, oh yes. Now I said, <clears throat> the scene is a wedding taking place in Kevin's yard. 
Is this mic working now? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. In a village in Russia. And this is the song that the women of the village were singing. <clears throat> sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, swiftly fold years. One season following another, laden with happiness oh, and tears. Well, um, these mark the poles of our life, either happiness or tears. They also, <coughs> they also mark the two fundamental notes running through the song. Well, uh, lament and praise are the two fundamental themes running through the Psalms, but the basic theme is praise. Okay. That is why the name of the book of Psalms in the original Hebrew is simply Tehillim, which means praises. All right. Well, now let's look at the first couple verses of this Psalm. And let's have another reader. Who wants to read Dwayne Hoven? Would you read, please, verses 1 and 2? And now as we go, Floya, as we go through these verses, uh, you might notice that there are four major Old Testament words for sin. This is dealing with sin in this uh, section. So the first two verses, please. Of what, of what Psalm 32? Of Psalm 32, yeah. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. All right. There are, and here are the four words for sin that we've already discovered in Psalm 51, remember? Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven. Now the Hebrew word, I've put it in your text here, is, uh, is pa'ah, the same word may be used for the rebellion of one treaty partner against another. Or also, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2, the rebellion of a child against parents. So, happy are those whose rebellions, whose failure to treat their parents correctly is, for, is forgiven. And then the next uh, line said, whose sin uh, is covered. Whose sin is covered. Now, what is the word here? <coughs> the word is, is uh, chata. And we already know what that word means. What does chata mean? Remember, we looked at it last week. What's chata? To miss the target. To miss the target. And if you had a slingshot, Ben, have you got your slingshot in your back pocket? No, but you saw Ben do that. To, to miss the target, that's a word for sin. Comes up in the New Testament, Ruth, as... Hamartia. Hamartia. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> it's important who you marry. Isn't it? <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> and remember, we looked at that Judges passage, Judges 2016, which tells about 700 left-handed marksmen from the tribe of Benjamin who could do what? sling a stone at a smallmouth bass and not miss. Right? There it is. Happiness is having one's life headed in the right direction, no longer being off target. So you're going to be happy if your rebellions are forgiven and your sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, Interesting, that word comes up in Psalm 38, verse 6, where a sick person says, I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all day long I go around mourning. According to this word, 
Happiness is being straightened out then, no longer twisted and bent out of shape like a sick person. All right. Happy are those to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Now, if you look to different translations, you'll see the translators do all kinds of things. Who's bent over, who is, you know, sinful or whatever. And then, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. If you look in your Hebrew Bible and that word deceit, it's the Hebrew remaya, which has the sense of not being uh, reliable. It says like a bow that is bent and crooked and not reliable. All right. There are four things that uh, happiness is, and it's all negative, being freed from these, these various words that have to do with sin. All right, let's continue reading the next section. Three, four, five, six. Who wants to read from the central section here? And Bob will give you the mic. Who would like to read it? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, three, five, three? Yeah, start with three, when I kept silent. While I kept silent, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. How would we put this in medical terms? Uh, you've got things that, that, that are eating away at you. You're psychologically not together. Your body is wasting away. I don't know. Can you describe this anyway? Your body is wasting away. Chronic. What? Okay. What's that? No. <laughs> Wasting away. Wasting away. Oh. Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. At any rate, um, if you've got physical problems, it's going to affect your whole body. Well, that isn't saying anything, is it? Through my groaning all the day along. Well, let's keep reading, uh, please. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Okay, so how are you going to get out of this? Continue. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I do, did not hide my iniquity. There are those same words for sin, again, iniquity. I, not, I confessed my sins. Go ahead. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. All right, so what do you do if you've got a lot of sins, you've done things that were wrong? Well, you confess them, and God forgives. And you, who is you here? You is God, who, and it says, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Well, let's finish two more verses. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. All right. So we had sin, and you can see how this fits in with what the psalm that talked about David and his sin you know, book him on murder one and adultery and who knows what all. His sin, uh, he confesses them, and now you forgave the iniquity or the guilt of my sin. And you finished uh, you down through seven, right? Did you read those verses? Yes. Yeah, okay. So here we are. <clears throat> What's it saying? If you have sinned, you need to confess your sins and in so doing, you will experience forgiveness. Any comments on the psalm this far? And do you see how it fits into the situation of David? Fits into David's situation. <clears throat> All right, well, let's go a little bit further, and let's pick it up with verses 8 and 9. Who wants to read... Uh, less, yeah. Start with eight. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. 
I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Oh, go ahead and continue. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So how ought you to be living your life now? One thing you're supposed to be doing. What are you supposed to do? Trust, okay. Rejoice. Be glad. Be glad. Be glad. Last verse. Good. Shout for joy. Yeah. This is all part of praise. Pardon? Yes. Happiness, right? Here's the way to happiness. What do you do? Well, you meditate on the Torah. You meditate day and night on these psalms. Some of you know Rolf Jacobson, <clears throat> who has taken my place teaching at Luther Seminary. And uh, they bought a cabin up in northern Minnesota on a lake not far from us. So we get together with the Jacobsons. And uh, Rolf said, or his dad or mother said, they wanted a good name for a Bible verse, you know, for to set off their cabin. And Rolf said he'd found it. It's, uh, they live on a lake called Mule Lake. <laughs> and he has taken this verse and put it up there, which says, do not be like a horse or mule without understanding. <laughs> so I think if you know Rolf, you know that that fits in quite well. <laughs> All right. Well, um... <clears throat> What else have we got? Anything else? And do you see how this fits together with Psalm 51, which is a confession of sin. And here, the forgiveness has been received, and it ends by saying, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, uh, you who are upright in heart. So, there, there is confession, and there is also rejoicing with forgiveness. No, anybody want to say anything else about this? <clears throat> What's the significance of steadfast love surrounding? Mm. Yeah, where have we got that? Uh, verse, verse 10. 10. Verse 10. Verse 10. Steadfast love surrounds. Steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Well, who's got an idea? What does that mean? Yes. Uh, well, the picture that comes to my mind because I'm reading a. Picture that comes to my mind because my wife and I are reading a book of a family or a couple that spent a year in the boundary water area is of uh, streams and lakes. The streams are torments. They rush down and the lakes surround and they're all. That's the picture in my mind. Streams and lakes. I have a comment that um, is a little different. It, I struggle with the uh, torments of the wicked because <clears throat> the good are also tormented. But we, I we know we're surrounded by steadfast love, but we can also be terribly tormented. It occurs to me that we need to learn to accept that torment sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Thinking of what's happening in or what happened in Florida. No, you have it in your hand. I sense that the torment is coming at the righteous. That's the way I read it. Oh, By yeah. the way, that's the way I read them. So the steadfast love is protecting you <coughs> from the torments of the world. That's how I read it. 
be non -fluid. Yeah, steadfast love, what's the New Testament equivalent? I guess it's agape. Agape, yeah. yeah. Agape, and how do you, Phil, when you teach, how do you explain agape? What is agape? I say it's the Greek word that the New Testament writers use to translate the Hebrew word chesed. <clears throat> yeah, there it is. Here's the word chesed. God is always the subject of chesed, or almost. Uh-huh, yeah. Is that how you would understand Yes, that? right. Chesed. God is the subject of chesed. Uh, anybody else have anything? Uh, any further comments on this song? The way to live. Yeah, go ahead. Question: I'm wondering if, if the way this reason way almost implies that you know the good are going to be happy and everything is going to be fine, and the wicked suffer. And I don't think that's our experience in the world. And I wonder if this is all like something you could use for a prosperity gospel, kind of an Old Testament thing, saying like, you know, if you're righteous, you're going to get blessed, and God will surround you. And if you're not, you know, you're going to with the and I think you look around and people say, you know, how long, O oh Lord, how do we have to suffer as the evil, the wicked prosper? It seems to me a little bit different. I would like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, one thing that I, yes, the comment here. Well, one, one of the best examples that I have of that, in my mind, is Job. Yeah. The reason yeah. Job suffers, yeah. the right. reason he is so distraught and loses all that he has, is uh, because of his righteousness. And that's what starts Job. When, when God says, have you considered my, my righteous man, Job? And that's the beginning. Yeah. The one that, there are some questions that we're never going to have answered, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but the one that, that I return to is that Jesus on the cross said what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what answer is given to the complaint of Jesus? What answer is given? Does it say, well, it'll only be a few more days, hang on? <laughs> or you had it coming? Or what? What answer is given to that question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What answer is given? No. Silence. No answer. No answer. Silence. But you, where are you? Elie Wiesel. If you read some of the things in Elie Wiesel, I, I like his story about the little synagogue in a small town in Poland. And uh, the Holocaust, the, the enemies, the Nazis had come through and uh, they destroyed every building in the village except the synagogue. And there was the beadle, the janitor, you'd say, who had the custom in this synagogue of starting before every service. He ran up to the front, and he had everything all cleaned up, like Ben and I came down here, straightened out the chairs and set everything up. And then he would walk up to the front, and he would say, uh, Lord, we are here then the service would begin. That was what he always did. But then the Nazis came through and the group was smaller and smaller and finally it got down to the point where there was only this beetle, only this church janitor left. And he did as he always did every morning. He ran into the synagogue, he straightened things out, he went up to the front and he said, Lord, you see that only I am here. And then he paused and said, but you, where are you? Yeah, where are you? And that's some of those psalms, like Psalm 22. My God, why have you forsaken us? I don't understand it. And we could go on with uh, examples, but anyway. <clears throat> Well, any other comments? Psalm 32, uh, I remember a course I had way back in college that uh, taught by Gerhard Frost where we studied Psalm 51 and then Psalm 22 as matching or going together with this. And I think that's what happened. 
If you look in your red hymn book when you're sitting in church waiting for it to begin, and look at the texts for Lent, you'll see that Psalm 32 is one of the texts that's suggested for Lent, along with 51 and some of these other uh, laments for Lent time. Anything else? I think we're about ready to close it down. A couple minutes, but uh, any final words? Yeah. I have a question. Question from A real short back. answer. <laughs> is, is, you know, from the Psalms to the suffering servant motifs and the suffering servant songs in Isaiah, it, the, between, is there a link uh, I mean, besides the fact of suffering, between the suffering servant and like the 30-second song and the 20-second song? Well, I think you can find links if you're looking for them, you know? <laughs> you know how it is whenever you, you look to And I think you're exactly correct. There are particular psalms that are very close to the things that are in Isaiah chapters. 40 through 66. Uh, and, you know, you'd have a nice time working through these things. Meditating day and night. Always thinking about these. And, you know, I have a Jewish friend who occasionally will call me on the phone and say, did you notice what there is in whatever text Isaiah 42 and 43 or something like that and he's all excited because he's found something new and he knows his Hebrew pretty well in fact he is commissioned with writing a English Hebrew dictionary Jonathan Paradise well Bob okay well thanks thank for inviting us <laughs> and Ben are you going fishing this afternoon or not do sort of fish down. Okay, thanks.